Mine, um, welcome to the Network Migration Services webinar on Australia this evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Kerr. I'm the owner and director of Network Migration Services, and I'm also a licensed MARA registered agent for Australia. So welcome to everybody tonight. Um, just a little quick little history on Network Migration. I am a Kiwi, um, a Network Migration and me. I'm a Kiwi. I'm a New Zealander. Um, I lived in New Zealand for 20 years, and then I moved to Australia, and I lived for 10 years in Australia, and I loved Australia. I really enjoyed my time there. Then in 1990, I came to South Africa on a business contract with a publishing house I was working for, for two years. And after my contract ran out, after those two years, I joined Network Migration Services. Um, and in 99, that was in 1993, and in 1996, I bought the business. So I'm very pleased and happy to say that over the past 30-odd years, we've immigrated over 18,000 families, mainly from South Africa. But in the last you know, few years, because of technology, we've got clients all over the world, as far away as China and the UK and you know the Philippines and Canada. And, and we've got literally got clients all over the world. So the, um, uh, the process of immigrating is what I'm going to talk about tonight. And I just want to, on the very first slide, you'll see my MARA registration number. You can check that on the MARA website for Australia. Um, and on that particular subject, please, if you're going to engage the services of an agent, make sure that the initial consult you have is always with the MARA agent, not somebody that works for the MARA agent or somebody that, I mean, there's a couple of companies in, in South Africa, and I'm not going to mention their names, but there's a company down south in Cape Town area. The MARA agent doesn't even live here. All right, the MARA agent, I don't even sure where that MARA agent lives, but they don't live here. So they do the consults with you. Now, that's not necessarily against the rules. It is for New Zealand. You have to be licensed to give immigration advice. But for Australia, if you don't have an office in Australia, then you do not need to be a licensed advisor to give immigration advice. I am, but you don't need to be. So be careful, ladies and gentlemen, because if you're using a MARA registered agent, um, the process is should be straightforward um, as possible, but because they're MARA registered, your money's held in trust. So if there's a problem and they and they and they and they don't do something or they make a mistake or whatever, you've got no recourse, none none whatsoever. If you're not using a MARA registered agent, because if you're using a MARA agent and there's a problem and the agent doesn't fix the problem, you can literally report us. We have to register every year. We have to maintain our um, continuous continuing development, um, professional development every year. Um, and my MARA license was just reissued a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, so you've got to maintain the licensing. So ladies and gentlemen, just please use a MARA agent if you're going to do Australia or if you're going to do New Zealand, an IAA agent, Immigration Advisors Authority. I just want to say thank you to our service providers. Um, we are quite literally the one-stop shop. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later when I'm talking about the relocation process. And I'm also a member of MIA, which is a Migration Agents Registration, excuse me, the Migration Institute of Australia. Um, Tessa, please cover trades too if you can. Partners are rigor. I'm qualified secondary school teacher. My partners are rigor, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, Tessa, you're in massive demand in Australia. Um, and you're actually going to be fast-tracked as well. Um, um, and then, Tessa, as I was saying... You're, you're going to be the main applicant here for Australia because you're going to get in way faster than pretty much anybody because teachers and healthcare workers are being processed really quickly. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But so you'll be the main applicant here. But your partner, I mean, I've never had a tradesman not get work in Australia. You'll land as a resident so he can do whatever he wants. Um, and there's lots of work in Australia, lots and lots of lots. Unemployment's 4%. So I wouldn't worry too much, Tessa. And if you want to be assessed, Please send me your CV. Uh, and it's, the assessments are free. Ruan um, did type in my email address. But our email addresses are our first names at networkmigration.com. So it's andrew at networkmigration.com. Montessori, VJ, you won't get into Australia as a Montessori teacher. I'm sorry. Um, you should be looking at New Zealand. Um, right. So. Coming back to oh, let's just start going through the slides, just thanking my. Uh, service providers. So let's, let's just go slide one. Right. About network migration, we've explained that. I'm going to do the Australian visa and points, relocation of partners I'm going to touch on, and then I'll then I'll touch on the questions. We literally should be finished in about 20 minutes, guys. Please take some screenshots of the slides I'm just about to show you. Uh, guys, if you want to be assessed, send me your CV. It's free. Andrew at networkmigration.com. 
And then if you want to have a consult, it's also free. If you're in Joburg, you can come and see me if you want to. But if you're outside of Johannesburg, we can do a Zoom, a Skype, a Teams, a Google Meet, whatever you want. And um, uh, meetings are free. And I consult Mondays to Saturdays. So Abednego, uh, sorry. Uh, I'd really need to have a chat with you. First of all, I need to see whether you qualify for Australia because it's not as easy as you might think. So let's get into that right now. Okay. Uh, we've talked about us. That's me a couple of years ago. Australia. I loved Australia, guys. It's a huge country. It's one of the biggest land masses in the world. Um, it's got uh, eight states and territories, and each state and territory has their own capital city, like Adelaide, Melbourne, Darwin, Canberra, Perth, Sydney, um, et cetera. That's six. I've missed two. Um, so Brisbane, of course, and Queensland, et cetera. I don't know what I've missed at the moment. But anyway, um, so the issue is um, it's a beautiful country, but the states are quite diverse. Perth is nothing like Sydney. Sydney's nothing like Brisbane, which is nothing like Melbourne, et cetera. Um, no, Shandan, you won't get in as an administration assistant. There's no way you'll get into Australia without a qualification. Um, and Jared, yes, the slides will be sent by emails. Yeah, they do, uh, Slungeli. They do. They do. Just again, email me your CV so I can check the qualifications. Uh, the teaching diploma is fine, providing it's the four-year teaching diploma, or he might have a degree in a PGCE. And if your husband has been, has been teaching for twenty-five years, Slungeli, how old is he? How old your husband, please, Slungeli? If you can type that in and just let us know how old your husband is. But Chandan, there's no way you'll get into Australia as an administration assistant. No. Manu, uh, that's a really, again, a difficult one to answer. We will never guarantee to find you a sponsor because you're, what you're asking for is somebody to hire you and pay for this process. That's extremely rare. Um, you'd have to be extremely highly qualified. Um, engine, engineers, you, you've got a chance of getting a sponsor um, as an engineer into Australia, but you could never guarantee it. So you would have to, you know, look at the process I'm just about to show you and decide whether you want to do it. But if you're looking for a sponsor, it's not something that we'll, we'll help you with, I'm sorry, because we just don't have the time. We're just too busy. Uh, Slungeli, if your husband is 52, as I'm just about to show you, he doesn't qualify for Australia. He's too old. So you're going to have to do New Zealand because the cutoff age for Australia, as I'm just about to show you, is 45 years old. Um, I've done a skills assessment for ICT business analysts. Is it possible to look for work? And I was, yes, it is. Please just contact me with your CV. I know I'm answering questions while I'm talking, but who was that? Uh, yes, yeah, Zamo, just send me, your, send me the skills assessment outcome. Email it to me and email me your CV, mate. Um, but the um, ICT business analyst, big demand. But why don't you just lodge a normal application? You're on the main skills list, so why don't you just lodge it? And then what about New Zealand for admin assistant? Yeah, Chandan. Yeah, again, New Zealand's a very different kettle of fish. We're not going to talk about New Zealand tonight, but send me your CV for New Zealand. Uh, John, we will check, definitely check the email tomorrow. Thank you very much, and we'll get on to you and sort that out. Walter, metal fabricated, no problem, Walter. As long as you're under 45, you're on their, you're on their skills list. Electronic equipment change person, Jonathan. Again, no problem as long as you're under 35. Um, lots of work. Chartered accountant. Yep, no problem, Indu. Uh, um, guys, you're asking me very specific questions, and it's going to waste time. Don't please say, I'm a healthcare worker. I'm a, just send me the CVs. Just send me the CVs. And I, a chartered accountant, again, no problem. Well, excuse me, Indu. I, I, I answered that as long as you're under 45. Um, thanks, Chanda. So just send me the CVs and then you can have the personal one-on-one. -on -one. It's not going to cost you anything. I'm literally going to give the information to you for free and then you can either use us or go and use somebody else or do the, do the application on your own. So um, there are, let me explain what happens here. Let me just get onto a slide that I want you to screenshot. So hold on one second. Where are we here? Ba, 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 ba. Right. First of all, there's not a visa we can't do. Skilled migrant, student, family, business, work, um, uh, I'll come back to that, excuse me, um, uh, spouse, uh, parent. There's really not a visa that we are not capable of doing. I have 24 colleagues, I have uh, 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 two licensed advisors working for the company, including me, and, and, and one more going through training at the moment. I know the next three years will be three more going through training. So we are very, very, very capable of handing any visa you want. I'm not going to be talking about business visas tonight or family or student. Contact me if you want information on that. I'm going to be talking about skilled migrant visas 
and work visas, okay? So take a screenshot of this or a photo with your camera on your phone. 65 points on skilled migrant is the lodgement mark. Now, when you do an Australian application, you must have your qualifications assessed. Must do. You cannot get into Australia without getting your qualifications assessed. If you don't have a formal tertiary qualification, if you don't have a qualification, you can forget getting into Australia. And I'm not talking about a certificate here and there. I'm talking about a degree, a minimum three-year diploma, or a trade. If you don't have a qualification, then you will not get a positive skills assessment unless you are a senior, senior manager because then you're assessed by the Institute of Management and Leadership. You don't necessarily need a qualification. And when I say senior, <coughs> I mean you're managing 40, 50, 60 people. Or you're an IT expert, because IT people often don't have qualifications. Okay? So the point of the matter is, if you're not qualified, then don't look at Australia. You could probably get into New Zealand, but you won't get into Australia. All right? You'll notice on the top left, your cutoff age for Australia on a skilled migrant category is 45 years old. So if you've already turned 45 or just about to, there's no way you'll get into Australia because that is, is the cutoff age. You cannot immigrate to Australia over the age of 45 unless you're doing a business visa. Then you can up to 55. Or you getting in as a spouse, clearly, of an Australian citizen. That would work. Doesn't matter what, how old you are. Or... You're perhaps, well, you really would. Parents, parents can get into Australia if their children are already living there, of course, and, it's, and they, they, they meet the requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So there's your points for your, um, for your age. Points for the qualification on the top right there, doctorate 20, bachelor's 15, or diploma or trade is 10. Points for English, 0, 10, and 20, depending on whether you get competent, professional, superior. There's over 30 assessing authorities in Australia. Some of them require your English test up front. So, for exa example, an accountant, any engineers, teachers, um, those are three occupations, for example, that are required to have their English test first and then their skills assessment done by the relevant assessing authority. Because if you send it off to, for example, let's say you're a chemical engineer and you send your qualifications off to Engineering Australia, if you don't send your English test results with it, they'll just decline your application and keep your money. Okay, so be careful. And this is what I'll advise you on, remember. I'm going to do that for free. So points for English. Now, you could be sitting in the UK at the moment or Canada. You're saying, hey, I'm a Canadian citizen. I don't need to sit the English test. You're right. You don't. But if you don't sit the test, you don't get the points. So you're exempt from it, but you might need the points. So you might need to sit it anyway. You'll notice just down below that, if your spouse's qualifications or has qualifications, and they're on the same skills list as you, and for Australia, there's two of them. There's the medium and long-term strategic skill shortage list. That's where you do what we call a subclass 189 visa from. And then we there's the STSOL list, which is the state and territory skilled occupations list. And each state has their own list. And that's where you do the 190s and the 491s from, okay, visas, which I'll explain in a minute. So if your spouse, let's say you're an accountant and your spouse is an engineer, then you're on the same skills list, okay? Now, this was this was the other slide, by the way. So let's just go back to this one. So on the bottom left, if you're both qualified, you can claim points for, thank you, everybody. Um, you can claim points for spouse's qualification and spouse English. And you might need that. The spouse English is fine. The spouse only needs to get a moderate understanding of the English language for you to get the five points. But if he or she has the qualifications, then you can then you can claim the other five points as well, okay? And then the points are for work experience on the bottom right here, three out of the last five years, five out of the last eight, and eight out of the last 10. So the work experience must be directly related to the qualification you're claiming. So you can't, you can't, um, you can't claim unrelated work experience. It's as simple as that, okay? Again, I will, I will assess you. Yes, you can. That's exactly what I just said, Zama. You can definitely do that. If they've had the skills assessment done as well, and English as well, then you're going to be able to claim an extra 10 points on top of your score. 
Okay. When I send you the pathways, when I when you send me your CVs and I send you the pathways, I will outline how I've scored you in the pathways. The first document I sent you was all the pathways, um, and then and the, all the fees associated with immigration side. The second document I send you is a quote for our services, and then the third document is just an assessment form. If you want to get cracking, you fill that in, pick a payment option that suits you. You send it back. We send you the agreement, and then we're up and running. Um, you know, does your spouse have to also have a pot? No, 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 not at all. Your spouse could be a housewife or a domestic engineer. Um, the spouse doesn't have to be qualified. It's only the main applicant that has to be qualified. I'm, I'm just saying if you have a qualified spouse, then you can claim extra points because you've got a qualified spouse. But the spouse doesn't have to be qualified at all. OK, the next slide is if you qualify, if you've got a qualification in Australia, you're going to excuse me, the top left there, you're going to get 10 bonus points. And then if you're a single applicant, which I know is a bit weird, and that's single being unmarried, you might even have children, but you don't have a partner, then you can claim 10 bonus points for being a single applicant, even though you're taking your children with you. Okay. And then the bottom, I mentioned just earlier, on a 189 visa, let me just come back a bit. On a skilled application, you can lodge three separate visas. So once you've had your skills assessments done, and your English language done, and that and that's been positively done, and you've got that, you've stuck it in the bank. Then we load the applications into the DHA website. It's called Skill Select. Now you can load an application into that site, and if you're not selected, um, you'll stay in that website for two years, and then you just reload it again if they haven't selected you. Now there are three types of visas you're applying for. One is a subclass one eight nine. And if you're applying for a subclass 189, you um, you need to um, be on the medium and long-term strategic skills shortage list. Okay? That's if you're on a 189. If you're not on that medium and long-term strategic skills shortage list, you cannot lodge a subclass 189. You'll have to do a 491 or a 190. Now, a 190, remember I told you earlier, there are eight states and territories in Australia, and each of them has their own skills list. So, for example, a, I don't know, graphic designer might not be, it's not on the medium and long-term skills shortage list, but let's say it's on the South Australia list, which is Adelaide area. So, that means that you could not be nominated by the state that you're on. So, what happens is at the, at the, at the beginning of July, Australia allocates uh, federal government says, right, you can immigrate, you can give out 160,000 visas in the next calendar year. And they allocate the states a certain portion of those visas. So Queensland might get 5,000 spots. And if you're a family of five, you take up five of those 5,000 spots, for example. Canberra, because it's small, might get 2,000 for the year. And the states normally, they, they get their allocations normally through July, which is the start of the Australian tax year. And they normally get reallocated at least once in the following 12 months. So once they've completed their allocations and they've nominated their, their, their set number, they close the state and then they uh, reopen when they get allocated again. So if you're lodging a 190, now subclass 190 is a visa that is permanent residency, you still get free schooling and healthcare, and you sign a declaration that says you're happy to live and work in the sponsoring state for a period of two years. Okay, you get five bonus points for a 190. You can see that on the bottom there. And if you get a sponsored by a state on a 491 or you're sponsored by an Australian family member, then you get 15 bonus points. That family member, I wouldn't use. I wouldn't do a 491 family sponsorship. The processing time is years and years and years because it's a very small allocation. So I would be doing a 491 state sponsorship which is 15 bonus points. And a 491 is a brand new visa. It came out November 2019, just before COVID hit. So we're actually processing 491s as we speak because they're a visa that has been issued to the client for five years. You've got a year to take it up. And for three consecutive years after that, the main applicant must earn $70,000 a year. That's pretty easy in Australia. But for those three consecutive consecutive years, you as a family cannot live or work in Sydney, Brisbane or Melbourne. You can live anywhere else in Australia except those three cities. Okay? So be aware of that. 
And even though it's a temporary visa on the 491, you still get free schooling and health care. All righty? Now, let's talk about that thing in the middle of the screen, 65 points. It can be tend to be misleading. I'll tell you why. If you're a diesel motor mechanic or a motor mechanic or a boiler maker or a fence, but if you're an accountant, they haven't selected an accountant on less than 80 points since 2016. For nine years, they haven't selected an accountant that hasn't hit 80 points. So just be aware that it can be a little bit misleading. I did a consult the other day with a potential client and that 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 had a consult with another agency, and I know this agency quite well. And one thing that I hate about this other agency is they don't give you the full facts. Guys, you're coming, if you're coming from Africa, you're coming from a rand-based economy, if you like, in South Africa, to going to a dollar-based economy. So this is not a cheap exercise. This is this is an ex, this is an expensive exercise. So if you're going to engage the services of an agent, for God's sake, make sure you understand the facts before you pay them a dime. And when I say the facts, I mean the full facts. What is the, I'm an accountant, for example. What's the likelihood of me? I'm on 70 points. What's the likelihood of me being selected? Probably zero at the moment, frankly. You might need to look at a 190 or a 491. So, and again, COVID did some major damage to immigra immigration, clearly. Um, so, what Australia is currently doing, as somebody asked earlier about the tradesmen, is they put pretty much all trade assessments on hold for a while. They did this a couple of months ago. They opened up plumbing last week. Okay, so they're slowly opening up the skills assessment process for, for tradespeople again. Okay, there are other assessing authorities you can use for tradespeople. It doesn't have to be vet assessed trades. Uh, but the point is, what Australia does is pre-COVID, they used to select every 14 days, just like New Zealand does. But then they went to monthly, and then they went to quarterly. So they only selected on the 189 skills list every 12 weeks. But in July last year, they were due to select, they didn't. In October last year, they were due to select, and they didn't. They selected in December, which they weren't supposed to, but they did. But the only occupations they took out of the skills list was educational, in other words, teachers, and healthcare workers. They didn't take engineers. They didn't take IT people, nothing. So they're playing catch-up tennis at the moment, the Australians, and they're catching up. There's no doubt about it. So I do believe by the middle of this year, it'll, it'll be back to normal. They'll start processing again and start selecting on time. I'm pretty sure the next selection will be March. It was supposed to be in January, but because they did it in, in in, um, in uh, December, they didn't select in January. So I think the next selection will be March, April, and then, of course, they'll reboot for the, for the July selection. So it's getting back to normal. So how long does this take? If you're a teacher and a healthcare worker, you're looking at this taking about three months because your assessments are done priority and getting you in is priority. We lodge the application, they'll select you the moment they open up the skills list again. That's why they selected all teachers and all healthcare workers pretty much in December. Um, but if you are a, if you're not a teacher or a healthcare worker, then you're going, this process is going to take somewhere between 12 to 18 months. I mean, if you're lucky, it could happen in nine, but I would never promise that. You're looking at somewhere, maybe 12 to 15 months. 18 might be a bit extreme. But from the moment you start the process, you're looking at 12 to 15 odd months before your visa is granted. Now, when your visa is granted, if it's a 189 and a 190, you've got five years to take it up. You don't have to go straight away. You can go, it's five years. But if you're not going to immigrate in the first 12 months, you must validate it in the first 12 months. And the only way to do that is to, is to enter the country. You and everybody on the application must enter the country if you're not going to immigrate in the first 12 months. You've got to get it validated. OK, um, if you're on a 491, remember, as I just told you, you've got to enter the country within the first 12 and then live in, in not live in Sydney, Brisbane or Melbourne. Yes. All righty. So. We are quite literally a one stop shop. I've been doing this for 30 years. We've got 24 team members that work for network migration. We have separate divisions. We have the. Yeah, it's very quick, Tessa. It's very fast. And that's because they want you. Um, um, AITSL, which is your teaching authority, has been told to assess you immediately as soon as you send the documents off. And then if we loaded your application, the moment they open, they'll select straight away. They've been told to 
teachers straight away. Okay. And that's federal government is telling the Department of Home Affairs, we want all educators, we want teachers. By the way, so does New Zealand. So if you don't qualify for Australia, we'll get into New Zealand, no problem. Anyway, so there's three divisions. One is the visa division, the division that prepares and submits all your application. I head that, I sign everything off. I'm a licensed advisor, of course. I have 10 file managers that work directly with me and the senior managers, and we put together your application. We literally, we will do the skills assessments for you. Um, we will, we will of course, lodge the applications for you. We'll do the state nominations for you. We literally do everything uh, when it comes to the visa division, okay? The second is the relocation division, which is things like flights, furniture, meaning at airports, accommodation, um, opening bank accounts, shifting pets, sending money, whatever. We're a one-stop shop. Your contact rose to that. Um, and uh, we'll put you in touch with our service providers, and that, that, that's a free service to do that. And the last one is the job search division, and we do not charge for it. The advantage you've got with Australia is 90% of you are going to have a visa up front. So then you hand it over to Liz and her team, and they will work with you to place you into Australia. But in the last 30 years, ladies and gentlemen, I've never had a client land in Australia and not get work because the advantage is you're landing as a resident. So, frankly, you can do whatever you want. You don't even have to stay in your profession. Okay. For those asked earlier about the work visas into Australia, it's called a subclass 482. That work visa process has actually been made a little bit easier. And a 482 is issued to you for two to four years. It's a temporary work visa. The issue you've got on a work visa for Australia is you do not get free schooling and healthcare. So you'd need to be aware of that if you're going in on a work visa. And most of you, if you're going in on a work visa, would work for a company for two years and lodge an application for residency in the third year. Or you could go in on the work visa and you could run a 189, 190 or 491 concurrently because a work visa is slightly faster. It takes about six months to get your work visa because in Australia, the company has to be an approved sponsor. They've got to apply to immigration to get a TRN number, which is an approved sponsorship number in order to hire a foreigner. And then once they receive the approved nomination, then you would upload your documents to that particular nomination number. Um, so the getting if the, the company might already be accredited, by the way, or, or um, have a sponsorship application approval, and that would save about three months. So if they're already approved, you'd get it in about three months. If they're not approved, it'll take five to six months. All righty. So, ladies and gentlemen, the crux of the evening is contact me, Andrew at NetworkMigration.com. Contact me if you want the information. I'm happy to give it to you, and I'm happy to give it to you for free. And then if you do decide to engage our services, we would be honoured and proud to, to help you and take you through the process to a successful outcome. People always ask me, well, what's our success rate? 99.5%. I've, I've, I've done 18,000 applications, and I can count the failures on less than one hand, on less than two hands. And there's really no reason we would fail. As long as you meet the requirements and you don't have a major criminal record and you don't have a major health problem, there's really no reason that the application should fail because you're doing everything offshore. So as long as you meet the requirements and you upload and submit the application correctly, and of course you sit the English test and pass the relevant mark that you need in the English test, then the application should be um approved. Thank you, Tessa. That's a very nice compliment. Thank you so much. So guys, ladies and gentlemen, contact me, Andrew at NetworkMigration.com. I'm going to be signing off now. Um, be, um, and I'm really, really sorry about the mix up with tonight. Uh, but it just shows that we're human. Um, you know, I'm not a robot. This is, you know, um, life goes on, even though I'm actually doing webinars at eight o'clock at night. So thank you, everybody, for listening to me tonight. To me tonight. Thank you, Ryan, for organising it as normal. Give me a contact over the next few days, guys. Send me your CVs. By the way, for Australia, I need to know your ages. So, so in your CV, it often doesn't have ages, which is fine. But I need to know the age and the structure of your family. So when you send me the CV, say, hi, Andrew, I'm 42. My wife's 38. We've got three children, you know, 16, 12, and four, or whatever it may be. So just let me know the structure of your family because I, I need your ages to quote you properly um, um, you, with your ages because I need to score you. But I also need to know the structure of your family in order to quote you accordingly, okay? MD, you're very, very welcome. And thank you, everybody, for listening to me tonight. I'm going to log off now. Stay safe wherever you are in the world. And if you do engage our services, we clearly look forward to working with you.